Hello everyone and welcome back to another Parry This Arthurian Legend video. Today we are continuing our series covering the most famous knights of the round table with Sir Lamorak de Gallus, or the Bold. This knight is one who gets mixed in rather well with several others, and has his good moments and bad, and is honestly one of the most skilled knights that ever served King Arthur at the legendary round table. So let's dive on in and get to know him. So there is actually more contention with Sir Lamorak than nearly every other knight of the round table, even the widely debated Sir Gawain, which is interesting because it is actually these two knights that would oppose each other most often, excluding perhaps Sir Tristram and Sir Lamorak. This is because their feud is actually a blood feud that goes back to their parents. See, the story for Sir Lamorak starts with his father, King Pellinor, a very skilled knight and fiery combatant. It was King Pellinor, in fact, that dueled King Arthur early in his reign, and it was in this duel that King Arthur would break his sword, Clarin, which he had pulled from the stone. Pellinor would almost slay King Arthur before Merlin intervened, and put a spell on him that would cause Pellinor to fall into a deep sleep until after Arthur and he had left. It was after this that Arthur would get Excalibur, and later Pellinor would join King Arthur out of respect for how he acquitted himself in their duel. Ironically, he gave King Arthur a lot of praise for not slaying him once he was unconscious, because Pellinor believed that in the blow which broke Arthur's sword, he had been knocked unconscious, and that it was not Merlin's spell that allowed them to escape. But that's enough of that tale. For this story, we need to focus on how Pellinor's actions would affect his youngest son, Sir Lamorak de Gallus. Well, early on in the war against the Eleven Kings, King Pellinor, fighting for King Arthur, would slay King Lot of Orkney in combat, helping Arthur claim a great victory. It was for this act that the sons of King Lot, Sir Gawain, Sir Gareth, Sir Gaheris, Sir Agravain, and their half-brother Sir Mordred, would oppose Sir Lamorak in the future. Ten years after Pellinor killed King Lot, Sir Gaheris and Sir Gawain would seek out King Pellinor, and there, Sir Gawain would challenge him to a duel, and would slay King Pellinor in open and legal combat. It is important that this distinction is made because it is this fact that it was a fair duel that made it so that Sir Lamorak could not avenge his father by murdering Sir Gawain. This would lead Sir Lamorak to other means of revenge but we'll get to that later. In most of the early tales and source material, Sir Lamorak is often viewed as a very skilled knight, but not an outstanding one. In fact, it wasn't until the post-Vulgate cycle and Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort to Arthur that he would be declared the third greatest knight at arms, after only Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram. No, in most of the earlier material, he would come after Lancelot, Tristram, Gawain, and Sir Gareth, and later when Galahad was added to the story, he would take the first place, defeating Lancelot in battle, therefore putting Sir Lamorak at the sixth best knight of the round table. Certainly a very impressive feat, considering there are well over 200 documented knights of the round table, but not so much as Mallory would have you believe. The first truly impressive feat we see from Sir Lamorak actually happens at the wedding feast of Sir Gareth, or the Tournament of the Castle Sauvage. It was at this event that Sir Lamorak would distinguish himself against no less than 30 other knights, many of which were notable knights of the Round Table or serving Lady Leoness of the aforementioned Castle Sauvage. Obviously, this was not as if he was at once stormed by all 30 knights and he defeated them instantaneously. That would be ridiculous. In fact, he spent the better part of the day distinguishing himself in combat, and throughout the day he defeated and either unhorsed or knocked unsensible 30 knights, allowing him to gain the day and be declared the day's victor. And, as he would not fight alongside the Orkney brothers, and that they served King Arthur as his closest relatives, he was often alone or in conflict with Arthur and his knights, who were the best knights in the land. So this event shows that he is willing to turn against his liege for his own personal interests. Interestingly, much of the stories that include Sir Lamorak have him playing against or as a foil to Sir Tristram, as the two quarreled a lot before reconciling and eventually becoming friends. The first time these two would clash would come after the previously mentioned wedding feast, as Sir Lamorak would be traveling through Cornwall. He was exhausted from the tournament and greatly diminished in strength and stamina. Upon hearing of his prowess and knowing that he must be tired, King Mark of Cornwall, a troublesome monarch, ordered Sir Tristram to do combat with him for the honor of Cornwall. Sir Tristram would see that Sir Lamorak was in no fit state to fight, but reluctantly agreed as it was an order from his liege. In the first run, Sir Tristram unhorsed Sir Lamorak without even breaking his spear, and as Sir Lamorak lay defeated on the ground, King Mark ordered Sir Tristram to finish him, but Tristram refused, stating that the combat itself was dishonorable given Lamorak's condition, and that continuing in any way would compound that issue. The 
Despite this literally saving Sir Lamorak's life, he was exceedingly put out by this show of courtesy, and was very angry at Sir Tristram from that day on, and this would lead to his next actions. See, after getting the tar whipped out of him by Tristram, Lamorak made to leave Cornwall and make for his estate in Wales, when he came across a messenger sent by Morgan Le Fay that was intended for King Arthur's court at Camelot. This messenger was bearing an enchanted horn that it was said, when a woman would drink from it, it would reveal if she had been unfaithful to her spouse. See, Morgan Le Fay had intended for this drinking horn to be sent to King Arthur, so that when Queen Guinevere drank from it, her infidelity would be exposed. However, still fuming about his defeat at Sir Tristram's hands, Sir Lamorak forced the messenger to instead take the horn to King Mark of Cornwall. It was through this act that King Mark's queen and Sir Tristram's lover, La Bile Sud, as well as 90 other women at the court, were almost exposed for adultery. Sir Tristram was able to convince King Mark that this was deception by Morgan Le Fay who wanted to destroy his court, and in the end no one was actually punished for it. But now Sir Tristram was just as mad at Sir Lamorak as Lamorak was at Tristram. An interesting side note from that last story, apparently nearly every woman in Arthurian literature was adulterous, something that during the 12th century when these tales were most popular would actually get a great deal of people in trouble, because the main people who wanted to hear these stories and songs were women of the court. So when these women's husbands would hear what their wives were paying to hear, they would often get more than a little upset that messages that contradicted not only the laws of their church but the laws of their lands were being spread in their own homes. At the very least this would get a singer thrown out on his ear, and it wasn't unheard of for the singer to lose his tongue, or if the Lord or King was feeling merciful, to spend a few nights in prison. A few times it was actually a religious official, such as a monk, who would be writing these stories down, and they would be forced to write disclaimers at the end of each story, highlighting the sinful nature of their contents under threat of excommunication. So just an interesting little historical footnote. It was after this that Sir Lamorak and Sir Tristram would for a time reconcile their differences, as both of them would be shipwrecked on the Isle of Servage. It was on this island that the two knights would have to put aside their differences and work together to defeat a mutual enemy, Sir Naban Le Noir. They decided that the best way to accomplish this task would be to attend a tournament that he had declared as Mystery Knights, and to defeat him in battle. It was in fact Sir Tristram who would accomplish this feat, and in doing so would actually slay Sir Naban in combat. The two knights would then feast together afterwards and start a truce that would turn out to be rather short-lived. It was less than a year later when Sir Tristram would be shipwrecked again, this time near the Castle Perilous in North Wales, an estate of Sir Lamorak. It was here that the two would see each other again for the first time since the Isle of Servage, and for some reason they would once again decide to break their truce and do combat because they still actually hated each other. They would then fight for well over two hours trying to kill each other, at the end coming to an exhausted stalemate and finally reconciling with each other. From here on out, they would no longer be enemies. It is important to note here that Sir Tristram was wounded and exhausted from having escaping a deadly shipwreck, and Sir Lamorak was well rested and ready to fight. So this duel highlights the differences in abilities of both of these knights. Sir Lamorak would have several more mentions throughout Arthurian legend, serving as a supporting character in stories including knights such as Sir Frol of the Out Isles, Sir Belians Le Orgulus, Sir Lancelot, and Sir Gawain. Each one of these would usually have Sir Lamorak serving as an Ulceran or a background character. The most notable of these encounters is his battle with Sir Meliagrant, who disagreed who the fairest lady in all of Britain was. Sir Meliagrant would insist that it was of course Queen Guinevere, and that after her it was La Bile Sud. Sir Lamorak would then disagree and insist that Queen Morgos, the widow of King Lot and the mother of Sir Gawain, was the fairest lady in Britain. This is the first time that Sir Lamorak would reveal a passion that would eventually become his undoing. Lamorak would win in this duel, but word would get out about his passion for Morgoth, and this would cause a lot of problems for quite a few reasons. See, if you remember from earlier in the video, Queen Morgos is the widow of King Lot, who was killed by King Pelinor, Lamorak's father, who Gawain would then fight in single combat and kill. So this is where all that blood feud stuff starts coming in again. Sometime after this event, Lamorak would become the widow Morgos's lover. Some have claimed that this was a way to get back at Sir Gawain, who had slain his father Sir Pelinor. Others insist that the two events are completely unrelated, but what is not contested, at least not to the main details, comes next. Eventually the two would be discovered in bed together, at Sir Gawain's estate, no less, and either Sir Agravain or Sir Gaheris, depending on the story, would behead their own mother in a fit of rage, but let Sir Lamorak go because he was unarmed. This act would greatly upset King Arthur, who was brother to Morgoth, and he would extend an offer of protection to Sir Lamorak if he would vow to cease their blood feud. Sir Lamorak, being a proud knight, would refuse these terms and leave King Arthur at the Sir Luce tournament to seek vengeance against the Orkney brothers. He would be met on the road by all of them, excluding the young Sir Gareth. How Sir Lamorak dies is usually depicted in one of three ways. 
The most common and the oldest way that the story is told is that when they met him on the road, Sir Lamorak threatened them and insisted that they remove themselves from his path or that he would ride them down. To this, Sir Gawain responded that they had a debt of honor to repay, and then challenged Sir Lamorak to single combat. In this combat, the two knights were both in peak fighting condition, and the fight was very close until the hour started to approach noon. At this time, Gawain's strength and speed began to increase, as they always did at this hour. And before the hour had struck noon, and Gawain had reached his maximum strength, Gawain had struck off Sir Lamorak's head, killing him. This is the original telling, and the way that the story is almost universally told all the way up until the post-Vulgate cycle, which is where Sir Gawain and his brothers usually cease to be heroes and start being depicted as villains, or at the very least, cowards. With the post-Vulgate cycle and, of course, Sir Thomas Mallory's La Morte to Arthur, a new version of events takes place. In this one, all of the brothers present attack Sir Lamorak at once. This includes Sir Gawain, Sir Gaheris, Sir Agravaine, and Sir Mordred, their half-brother. Sir Gareth is also not present in this version. In this tale, the fight goes on for some time before Mordred sneaks up behind Lamorak and stabs him in the back with a dagger. This version of the story is designed to make Lamorak appear to be far more skilled in combat than Gawain and all of his brothers, and makes his death appear less honorable and turns it from a legal duel into a murder. The final version of the story comes later, and in my opinion is the least interesting of the three. In this one, Mordred sneaks up on Lamorak while he is asleep and slits his throat, then hides his body and for many years his disappearance and apparent murder are not solved. I find this story to be extra boring and definitely intended mainly to make it seem like Sir Lamorak could not be killed in combat. This story does have its use as it shows that Mordred is a bad guy, but given that later on in the story he takes over Camelot and kills almost everyone, I think it might not be wholly necessary for the end result. No, I consider the original ending to be the best one to consider canon for various reasons. For one, insisting that Lamorak could not be beaten by four highly skilled knights of the round table, one of which is widely considered to be the third or fourth best knight ever, in open combat is ridiculous. Anyone that knows anything about this type of combat knows that no matter how skilled the one opponent is, if that one person faces off against four people who are even marginally competent, the four are going to win. Secondly, Lamorak's skill level was never this exceedingly high until the post-Vulgate cycle, where he is actually used as a literary tool to make other knights, such as the Orkney brothers, look bad. So at this point, they are no longer trying to tell a story, but now to push a narrative. Finally, all skill arguments aside, other than Sir Agravain, who is often seen as somewhat of a tool or even a coward, and Sir Mordred, who is actually the ultimate bad guy in Arthurian legend, the Orkney brothers are generally seen to be some of, if not the best and most honorable knights at King Arthur's court. So I see no reason why we should believe that for this story, they threw their honor away and decided to kill one inconvenient and rather unimportant knight in such a cowardly way. So for these reasons, I conclude that Sir Gawain killed Sir Lamorak in fair, open, and legal combat, thus ending that tale. Sir Lamorak's arms are described or depicted as either a white lion or a leopard on a purple field surrounded by gold or silver crosses, or as two silver axes crossed on a blue field. For these arms, I would just assume that while serving King Arthur, as a knight of the round table and therefore most of his career, he wore the first arm, and that the later arms are the ones that he bore before becoming a knight of the round table. Honestly, Sir Lamorak is a knight of the round table that I find to be quite intriguing and generally entertaining. He is said to be one of the greatest knights of all time, and his skills are more than considerable in all stories. I only contest his feats when they start to be elevated above other established knights in the post vulgate cycle, for the sake of pushing the French narrative. But in the end, the canon is up to each of us. So what do you think about Sir Lamorak? Do you think he was the third best knight of Arthur's court like Mallory would insist, or do you agree with me that he is sixth or maybe fifth at best? Let me know in the comment section. But for now, thanks for watching and have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.